Well, if you were here last week, I hope you noticed the four generations in that short video. Megan, who, uh, who attends the church I pastor in California, who's a Christian school teacher, uh, but also on our worship team at the church, Megan's sharing how she is, has people that help her grow in the Word. I'm her pastor, and this other guy, Jared, a friend of hers, are, help, are kind of taking her hand, helping her grow in the Scriptures. But Megan is also growing in the Word and reading the Scriptures and becoming more like Jesus through the Scriptures. But she has then taken Rachel's hand, this young woman who's also part of our church, and influenced her to the point where Rachel made a commitment to Jesus and was baptized. And now Rachel, the younger girl on that video, is part of our church. She's on the worship team now, and she's helping younger women in the church, taking their hand and helping them grow in Jesus. Those four generations, that's how the church of Jesus will go on until Jesus returns again. If we don't take the hand of the next generation, who will? And so in each aspect of our spiritual growth, we're not just thinking about our own growth, we're thinking about who can help us grow, how we're growing, how we help others, how we teach them to pass it on to the next generation. And so this week we're thinking about what Megan was sharing about, about scripture, about the Bible. And, and when you think about the Bible, it's, and most of you probably know that the, the most sold book in the history of the world is the Bible, but I want to put it in perspective for you. The second most sold book in, recorded in the history of the world is A Tale of Two Cities. And A Tale of Two Cities has sold over 200 million copies. That's a lot of books. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone has sold over 120 million books. The Hobbit, J.R. Tolkien, has sold over 100 million copies. When you count those books, you count them in, in the low hundreds of millions. The Bible has sold over 5 billion copies. I mean, think about it. That's not the bestseller by a little bit, by multiple, multiple times. And... People, people who study this kind of stuff would say there's also been another 25 to 30 billion copies of the Bible printed that weren't sold. Why weren't they sold? Because they were given away. That happens every year still, all over the world. Our church gives away hundreds of Bibles every year to anybody who wants a Bible. We, have, we buy them by the cases, and we give, give people a nice starter Bible for themselves. And, and so, so th th there's, you know, the, the Bible is the greatest selling book in history, but it's also the, the top-selling book every single year. Every single year. Now, if you go, on a, if you go online and you search top-selling books, the Bible is often not on those lists. Number one, because it just crushes every other book. But also, I think, because there's some people who don't want to list the Bible as the number one book. But every year, globally, the Bible sells more than any other book. It's the book that's been translated in the most languages all over the world. It's the book that's the most read of any book in the history of the world. It's the book that's most quoted than any other book. And, and so we look and say, you know, the, the, this is the Bible. And yet, here's the weird thing. You get some college student or some, some, some scholar who decides they don't like the Bible, they don't think, it, they don't think it's true, they, they, and, and they put on a YouTube video for five minutes and pull a couple of verses out of context and beat up on the Bible, and people go, I guess I can't believe the Bible anymore. Because of one or two voices out there of people who don't even really understand what the Bible says. And so today we're going to think about biblical engagement and what it means for us to really engage with the Word of God. And, and to do that, I want you just to quiet your heart for a minute. And I want to read a passage of the Bible. This is a passage that people have heard read to them or that have read in times of great joy, in times of great sorrow, at the bedsides of people who are drawing near the end of their lives. Just quiet your heart and listen to the Holy Spirit breathed true word of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord ever. Oh, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of Scripture. Thank you, Spirit of God, for breathing 
the truth of your word through different people, through different times of history, for orchestrating over it and giving us the Bible, your word. We pray that today as we think about your word, we won't just understand more about it, but we will love it more and live it more and learn from what you say in your word. We pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Well, today and over the next seven weeks, you're going to be thinking together about what does it mean to be a disciple, to be growing up in spiritual maturity with the fruit of the Spirit growing in our lives with love and joy and peace and patience, all these fruit growing in our lives. What are the things that happen in our lives that help us grow up in faith? And, and you'll see the seven of them up on the screen here. It, it's Bible engagement, taking other people's hands. They're helping us grow, growing in the Word, sharing God's Word, teaching other people to do it. It's that, that journey. It's passionate prayer. We'll think about that next week. It's wholehearted worship and growing in that. It's humble service like Jesus served. It's joyful generosity, consistent community, and naturally sharing our faith, organic outreach. And in each of those areas, there's, there's sort of this simple journey of, uh, uh, that we would know and we would grow and that we would go. Know, grow, grow. Go. So we would know how Jesus lived. In each of those areas of spiritual growth, we look at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We look at the life of Jesus, and we need to know how Jesus lived. Why? Because we're his disciples. We're his followers. So first we know the life of Jesus, and we're going to think about that together. Then we grow personally in prayer, in humble service, in growing in God's word, so we know how Jesus lived out a life of faith, we grow to be more like Jesus, and then we go, it inspires us to go and share the love of Jesus. So we know, we grow, and we go. We know, we grow, and we go. Say it with me. We know, we grow, and we go. That's the journey of a disciple. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to first look at Jesus, then look at our lives, and look at the world that needs to hear about Jesus. So first, we know Jesus loved the Spirit-breathed words of the Father. Jesus loved the Scriptures, the books of the Old Testament that, that, that were there when Jesus walked on this planet. Jesus loved the Scriptures, he knew the scriptures. They were on his heart and on his lips again and again and again. As disciples, we need to look and say, do we, do we really love the spirit-breathed words of scripture? Let me ask you a question. I want you just to reflect on this. What comes out of you when you are squeezed by life? When things get really tough? When things come crashing into your life unexpected and things get really tough, what, when you're squeezed by life, what squeezes out of you? What comes out of you? For some people, it's anger and rage. For some people, when, man, when, thing, when times get tough, when things come on them, the people who know them well start stepping away from them because they know, Bull. they just, when things get tough, what comes out of them is anger and rage. For some people, what comes out of them is fear and retreat. Some people, when they come to a tough time, they start backing off and they start to just get nervous and afraid. Things are tough. And what comes out of them is kind of fear. And they start pulling away. Different things come out of different people in tough times. You know what comes out of some people when things get really tough, really fast? They don't know where it's, it just kind of crashes in on them. Some people, what comes out of them? Profanity. Something hits them and it's just boom, out of their mouth comes. I mean, we all, different things come out of each of us when we get squeezed by life. But what came out of Jesus when he was squeezed? When Jesus hung on the cross, nailed to a cross, taking our sins and our shame and our judgment and our punishment for all of our sins, what came out of Jesus when he hung on the cross? Two things, blood and scripture. When he hung on the cross, he bled to pay the price for our sins and scripture came out of Jesus. When he hung on the cross, the word of God came out of his mouth. I just read Psalm 23 to you, but it was Psalm 22 that came out of Jesus when he was being squeezed and paying the price for our sins. Listen to these words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the cries of, my cries of anguish? My God, I cry to you by day, but you do not answer. By night, but find no rest. 
Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, bearing our sins, taking our shame, what came out of him was blood as a payment for our sins, and Scripture came out of him. See, we're his disciples. We're supposed to be like him. So when pressure comes on us, you know what should come out of us? The Word of God. We should be so filled up with his truth that it flows out of us. In pain, Jesus quoted the scriptures. Where did Jesus turn when temptation came? See, Jesus never fell into temptation, but he was tempted. Being tempted isn't sin. Following temptation is sin. And in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, there's an account of Jesus in the wilderness and the enemy, Satan, coming and attacking him and tempting him. And each time the enemy tried to tempt Jesus, each time the the enemy kind of threw a line out in the water with a little lure, waiting to see if he could hook Jesus and get him to do something wrong, each time Jesus responded with Scripture. So the enemy says, Jesus, turn these stones into bread. You've been fasting for 40 days. You're pretty hungry. Turn the stones into bread. And Jesus says these words, It is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know where he quotes from? From the Pentateuch. He quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. As a matter of fact, with all three temptations, with each temptation, when Jesus says, it is written, he quotes, he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. Do you know your Deuteronomy pretty well? Everybody here pretty much, you've mastered the, you know, you've spent a lot of time in Deuteronomy. People, people skip right over, there's, there may, there's not much in there. If Jesus is in the wilderness being tempted by the devil and quotes Deuteronomy three times, there's some good stuff in there, right? And then the enemy comes again. Says to Jesus, go to the the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point on the temple grounds, on the temple mount there, and throw yourself down. And then Satan twists and distorts Scripture, says, because if you throw yourself down, doesn't the Bible say that the angels will come and catch you? It says, Jesus, throw yourself down. Then you'll be flying, you're falling through the air, about to crash, and the angels will come swooping in, whoosh, and they'll catch you and save you. And everybody will go, whoa, that must be the Messiah. Wouldn't that be great? And Jesus says to the enemy, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. No, he quotes scripture. The enemy tries again. Bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all the goodies and all the power and all the glory of the world. And Jesus says, It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. When we look at the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus in times of temptation and struggle. Where does he go? Scripture, scripture, scripture. Again, we're his disciples. So we go, okay, then that must be how I should live my life. Jesus was, (coughs) excuse me, Jesus was the embodiment of scripture as he fulfilled prophecy and made reference to the Old Testament over and over. Jesus was not only the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah, but Jesus kept pointing to the Old Testament again and again and again. If you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, watch for when Jesus says this. When Jesus says, you have heard that it was said. He said that a lot. You have heard that it was said. Almost every time what comes next is going to be in quotes. And that's a scripture from the Old Testament. Or when Jesus said, it is written, he's quoting the scriptures. So Jesus, in his conversations, he just brought up the Bible again and again and again. Just in normal conversations. It is written, you have heard that it was said. And then he clarifies and he explains. But Jesus just went back to the scriptures again and again and again. Jesus taught the scriptures. He formally taught in in the synagogues, on the street corners, in the temple grounds. He would teach the scriptures. Let me pause and say a word to anyone here, anyone online. If you've ever taught a children's class or a youth class or or an adult Bible study, if you've you've ever taught God's word, (coughs) um, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to study and to prepare. You say, well, it was just, it was just, you know, it was just four middle school kids and it didn't seem like they were paying attention when I was teaching. No, no, thank you. Thank you for opening this book and doing your best to teach others. To every parent or grandparent who's tried to share the scriptures with your kids or grandkids and teach them about God's word, thank you. Keep it up. Keep doing it. Even when they seem like they're not getting it. Keep sharing, because Jesus modeled teaching the word. So first, 
We look at the life of Jesus, and we, and we just need to know how he lived. And Jesus lived the scriptures. The scriptures came out of him. In the toughest moments in his, in his life, he went to the scriptures. We should do the same. But here's the second thing, number two. A question, do I love the scriptures like Jesus did? Do I love the word of God? Do I love the scriptures? Am I growing? Do I not just know, but am I growing in the scriptures in my own life? And I need to tell you, this book, I, I was given my first Bible when I was 15 years old. I'd never held a Bible before. I'd never heard the Bible read before. I didn't grow up in the church at all. I didn't know any of the Bible stories, none of them. You said, well, you knew, certainly you knew like David and Goliath. I didn't know any of them. I was given a revised standard version, Harper Study Bible with study notes by Harold Linzel, about this thick. And the person who gave it to me said, all the little words at the bottom of the page, those aren't the Bible. That tells you like where it was happening and what the words mean. But all the larger words, that's, that's God's word. That's the Bible. That was my Bible training. This is God's word. You're supposed to read it. Okay. I've been doing it ever since. Just, 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 just digging into this book and reading it ever since. And can I tell you something about this book? If I wasn't reading this book regularly and faithfully, my marriage of 38 years would have lasted about two years. I didn't know how to be a husband. I didn't know how to live the way I'm supposed to live, but this book taught me. When God gave us three kids, I'd have blown it more than I did <laughs> if I hadn't had this book to guide me and direct me. The kind of friend I am is shaped by this book. My financial life is guided by this book. The way I handle stress and struggle in life is guided by this book. This, this book is God's word. It speaks to our hearts and our lives. And, and we're in a generation that has more Bibles available but less Bible reading than almost any other generation in history. We're becoming a church of people who own Bibles but don't read them. And I want to challenge you to really say, Spirit of God, speak to my heart. I want to not only know that Jesus loved the word, but I want to love the word of God like Jesus did. I want to take hold of it and let the word of God take hold of me and guide my life. And so there's really three steps in the, if you're going to engage in the Bible, there's kind of three natural steps to take. The first is to love the Bible, to say, Lord, I love your word. To agree with David in Psalm 119, when David says, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it. I think about it. I ruminate on it. I mean, I meditate on it all day long. I just think about your word. My mind and my heart are filled with your word. Say, God, to say, God, help me to love your word. Now, let me be clear about something. Please hear this. We don't worship the Bible. We worship only Jesus. We love the Bible because it points us to the Savior. We love the Bible because it shows us how to live. But to say, Lord, help me love your word and hunger for your word. And then second, not only love the Bible, but learn from the Bible. To say, God, let me open this book every day, and learn from your book. I want to challenge you every day of your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, definitely for you. If you're searching and seeking for Jesus, do this too. But every day, let the words of this book get in your heart and get in your mind. Now listen closely. For some of you, you like to read. So open your Bible and read it, or open your Bible app and read it. Do it every day. Do it when your mind is fresh and clear. And spend some time in the Word. If you're not a big reader... I would challenge you to start listening to the Bible. You can get free Bible apps on your phone, and you can just pick any part of the Bible, a little speaker in the corner, and it will, the, your phone will read. You can even pick, like, I want like a British person to read it to me. You've got different even voices, different people reading it. And listen to God's word. Our middle son, Josh, when he was in his teens, we recognized, even though he liked, liked studying and thinking, he wasn't big on reading at that point in his life. So we got him the Bible on discs. Now you can just have it on your phone, but we get him these discs. He started listening to the Bible. And he found that really connected for him. So right now, to this day, now our son Josh will wake up in the morning. He'll have his phone next to his bed. He'll grab his phone. He'll go to our church. He'll go to the Shoreline app. And we have seven days of reading. Every week we have seven days of Bible reading to get you ready for next Sunday's sermon. And so he'll, he'll just go, okay, it's Monday. He'll click on Monday. Passage will open. He'll click the little speaker. He'll set it next to his bed. He'll lay back. And he just listens to, he lets his phone read the scriptures to him. He says most days he'll get up, look up, get it, hit it again, listen to it again. And he'll go, I kinda, he, gets his heart, he gets the word in his heart and his mind by just listening to it. Now, some of you are thinking that you're thinking, that doesn't count. That's not reading the Bible. But can I tell you a little secret? Through most of history, most people listened to the Bible and didn't read it because people didn't have Bibles. Before the Gutenberg press, homes didn't have Bibles. The church might have a Bible. They were, they, you know, before the press, they, it, was, it was handwritten. 
And in the world today, many, many people in the world today don't read. But there's organizations that, that have audio Bibles where they can listen to the scriptures. There's people that sit in groups of 10 or 15 people every day and listen to the scriptures. Listening to the Bible counts. So some of you are going, like, I don't really like to read. Then, you know, maybe you say, I, I'm in my car driving for two hours a day. I'm in my truck driving four hours a day. You know, you turn off some of the podcast, turn off some of the music, and put on the word of God. Let it fill your mind. Let it fill your heart. Let it saturate you. If you like to read, open the Bible. Read it every day, every day, every day. And say, Spirit of God, as I open the word, speak to my heart, do something in my life. So love the Bible, right? And then learn from the Bible. And then the third thing is live the Bible. Live it out. Let it change you. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Follow what the Bible teaches. When the Bible challenges you, let yourself be challenged. When the Bible convicts you, let yourself be convicted. When the Bible encourages you, let yourself be encouraged. But when the Bible teaches you something and you're not living that way, adjust your life to fit what the Bible teaches and your life will become better and better. Here's the key. It's the balance of information and transformation. Information and transformation. We read the Bible, we listen to the Bible, we get the information. Now we have to let it transform us and change us. I, I didn't grow up in the church, but I, um, I know people that have, and they would tell me they, were, they, they remember as a kid having a thing where the, all the kids would hold their Bible, they'd come to like Sunday school or Wednesday night catechism, or whatever, and they'd hold their Bible, and then the teacher would say, swords up, and they'd all hold their Bibles up in the air. And then the teacher would say, you know, like, Ezekiel 3.23, and everybody have to go and find it, and whoever found it first and held it up first, they got like a point. So they have like a Bible, finding, finding stuff in the Bible races, you know? And then there might be like Bible memory and Sunday school class, and you get a star for Bible memory, and if you get so many stars, you get a kind of a special treat, and, and that's all great. But, but once you have the information, you have to say, now God, let there be transformation. Change me through your word. So you go more and more into the word. And you read the scriptures more, and you should have greater joy, even in tough times, because you know who you belong to, and you know who loves you. If you go deep in the word, all of a sudden, you're, you're maybe a person that responds with, with anger, and you, you, you get fired up really quickly, and you start to have a more peaceful heart, because you're being transformed by the teaching of God's word. You're a person that tends to be self-centered and want to do things for yourself, but you start serving other people, because God's changing your heart through his word. You're by nature a little stingy and you don't want to share what you have and you're, you call yourself thrifty, but you know, really you're stingy and you don't want to share. And God begins to make you more generous and you say, I'm changing as I read the word of God. You, when somebody wrongs you, you want to get them back, but all of a sudden you're learning to pray for them instead of retaliate. You go, man, I'm, I'm changing. That's transformation. God's word through the power of the spirit can transform our lives. And then I want to give you a, a two really good theological terms. If you like theological terms, Brace yourself because you're going to love this. But uh, they're exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis and eisegesis. These are words that are used around the topic of biblical interpretation. So here's my Bible here. And there's really two ways to come at the Bible. Two primary ways. There's eisegesis where I pick, I think what I like and what I believe and what I think. And I try to make the Bible agree with me. I put what I believe into the Bible and there's exegesis where I try to let the Bible bring the truth out to me. Exegesis, we get our word exit or exhale, you know, something. So, so the, what exegesis is you read the Bible and whatever it says, it speaks to you and you change your life to fit the Bible. A lot of people today are into eisegesis. People say, well, okay, I think the Bible's fine. I like going to church, but I know how I want to live. I know what I want to do. I, want to, I know how I want to view salvation, how I, want to view, how I want to view gender or sexuality or whatever. I pick my views, it's usually the world's views, and then I try to make the Bible agree with me. So what I'll do is I'll pick a verse from here and a verse from there, and I'll kind of avoid those verses. And, and here's the thing. With a book as big as the Bible, if you take it and you cut and paste and ignore some things and take things, you can make it say almost, people have made the Bible say all kinds of horrible things the Bible doesn't really say. So people will do that with the Bible sometimes. That's I said, Jesus. I know what I believe. I have my truth. And by the way, there's not my truth. There's only God's truth. There's only the truth. But there's people who go, well, I have my truth. So they come and they try to make the Bible agree with them. Please don't do that. That's not the way God has designed the scriptures. God is wiser than we are. God gives his word. He's breathed it by his Holy Spirit. It's true from beginning to end. And so here's what exegesis is. I read the scriptures. I listen to the scriptures. I ask God to speak to me. And whatever God teaches 
God brings out of the scriptures, the truth comes to me, and I have to adjust my life to accommodate scripture. I adjust how I see the world. When I became a Christian, I saw the world in all the wrong ways. And I kept reading the Bible going, oh, the way I see that is wrong. I had to change my perspective, change my attitude, change my behavior. I'm still doing that. And I've been a pastor for almost four decades. There's times where the scripture will hit me and it's like, man, Kevin, your attitude is wrong. Am I going to fight with God and tell him I disagree or am I going to just make my life try to align with scripture? That's, you know, so, so you want to, you wanna, when it comes to scripture, you want to exit Jesus, let the truth come out, exit the text and change your life, not imposing your ideas on the Bible. And then we've got to learn to lock scripture into our hearts. We've got to learn to take the word of God and meditate on it and think about it and memorize it. And Bible memory isn't just for Sunday school kids. It's for all of us. If you're a business leader, you should commit some passages to, to memory about honesty and integrity in business. If you're an employee, you should commit some great scriptures to mind and to your heart about giving your best and working your hardest. Because of all people in the workplace, Christians should be the ones who stand out as always giving their best. There was a pastor, uh, Richard Wormbrand, and his wife, Sabina. There's actually movies about both of them. The, the, the movie about Richard Wormbrand is called Tortured for Christ. The, the movie about his wife, Sabina, is just called Sabina. And if you, if you ever want a great movie, those, the, the one about Richard Wormbrand, will be, it's a hard watch because he was locked in prison for 14 years and beaten every day he was in prison. He spent three years in solitary confinement in a cell 12 feet underground with no light for three years. Never gave up on his faith. But he knew when, when, the, when communism was coming to Romania and, when, uh, and then when the Nazis began to come in, they, they were invaded on different fronts in different times and then this, over the stretch of a couple of decades, he knew that at some point, because he wasn't going to compromise his faith, he knew he would go to jail. And he knew that when they put him in jail, they'd take his Bible away. And he had found out that there were 360 verses in the Bible that talk about not fearing. Fear not. 365 verses. So he committed all 365 verses to memory. One for every day of the year. And he kind of put them, one for each day of the year. So that when they arrested him, he asked those who arrested him one question. What day is it? And that day he began to meditate on that first scripture. So that when they put him in solitary confinement, in darkness, for an entire year, he had a scripture every day in his mind and on his heart to hold on to and to not walk in fear. Where do you need to memorize scripture? Where do you need to be fortified in your soul? What's coming your way that you need to get ready for? And take time to let God's word fill you and guide you. And, and, and so we, we look at Jesus and we, we, we know, we learn from Jesus about how he viewed scripture. We grow in the scripture in our own lives, but then when we're growing in the scriptures, we then begin to go with Jesus into the world. Do you know that if you're growing up in faith in any of the areas, passionate prayer, humble service, if you're growing in faith, it will always take you to where Jesus is going. And he's always going to lost sheep. He's always going to the world with his love and with his grace. And so the third thing is how going deeper into the Bible should take us deeper into the world. The deeper you go into this book, the more you'll go to the world with the love of Jesus. You say, well, I don't like to share my faith or anything. I'm just saying, the more you get to know this book, the deeper you go, the more you know the truth of this book and it fills your heart, God will take you along with him and you're gonna start to shine his light in ways you didn't even know you could. You're gonna start to share his love in ways that are gonna surprise you. You're not standing on the street corner yelling at people. You're just living your life, but when you're so filled with scripture, it overflows wherever you go. And so here's the reality the world is longing for good news. And the Bible brings the best news in history. Do you think, are people in our world looking for good news? Would people like some good news? What's the answer? You go, Absolutely. There's an old saying, no news is good news. You know what that means? That means that all news is bad news, pretty much. If, if, you, you know, if you get no news, that's actually good news because pretty much most of the news you hear is bad news. But people are looking for good news. And here's the thing. This book is filled with good news. Not only the gospel of Jesus, good news of salvation, but there's all kinds of good news. So, so if you read this book and you fill your mind and your heart with it, you can go out and tell people that they're loved. People that are far from God. Do you know there's a God who loves you? You know, the Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son. First John says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us 
and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Love starts with God. The more you read this book, you see the love of God for broken, sinful people like we were or still are if we don't yet know Jesus, and we can share that love with others. We can tell people that God is near. You know, most people in the world think that if there is a God, he's off distant somewhere, and we know he lives right inside of us. The more we learn the Bible, the more we can tell people there's a God who's near you. You can tell people that there's purpose and meaning in this meaningless, crazy world. You can find true meaning in Jesus. We can share that. We can tell them there's a Savior named Jesus who can wash their sins away. We can tell people in this lonely world where people are so disconnected, there is a family of God in the church that would bless you if you want to be part of it. We have a lot of people in our church that don't know Jesus yet, but they just want to belong somewhere. And as they come become part of the family, they meet the Father who oversees all of us. They meet his son, Jesus. They sense the presence of the Holy Spirit and they become followers of Jesus. We can share the good news that there's a God who wants to actually guide your life in this directionless world. They can find direction for their life. We can tell people they can have joy and sadness, peace and turmoil. All these things are available. We can tell people that there is a God who is preparing a place for them forever if they'll just put their faith in his only son. Our world is dying for good news. And every day you read this book, you discover more good news. And you can share it with people. Not creeping them out, not being overbearing. Just share the good news you've learned. What it means for you. And people will wonder, could I have that too? And you'll say, in Jesus you can. In Jesus you can. The Bible gives us a mission And it's God's mission. When you read this book, you see the mission of God and you find out that that's your mission too. Mark 10, 45 says this, for even the son of man, that's Jesus, even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came not to be served by others, but to serve and to lay his life down. And when you read the scriptures, you find out that he calls you to share your life and to give your life for the sake of his mission, for the sake of his gospel. You'll be captured by the mission of Jesus if you keep reading this book. You can't miss it. The scriptures reveal the heart and the love of God. When you read this book, even when you can't put all the pieces together, you see the love of God. In 2 Peter 3.9, 2 Peter 3.9, we read these words. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, the Lord, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's the word of God. God desires that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. Now, we understand that many people don't receive that gift. We're not universalists. We don't believe everyone's going to heaven, only those who receive that gift. But the heart of God, however it works in God's sovereignty and God's calling and God's work, the the sense that God desires that none would perish and that the grace of Jesus is big enough for all who would receive it. And when we read the scriptures, we, we just get the heart of God and we see the mission of God and we feel the call of God. And then when you read this book, when you love the word and when you live the word, you know, and, and so, so, so you're loving, you're growing, you're learning, you're living. When it becomes who you are, you change. And you look different in this crazy world. The more you, more you love this book, the more you learn from this book, and the more you live this book, the more you stand out. So following the teaching of the Bible will make us shine like a light in a dark world. The more you follow the teaching of the Bible, you will shine like a light in this dark world. Let me put it in different words. You'll look weird. You'll look out of place. What do you mean? You look weird. Well, try this on for size. When you begin to serve people who would never serve you back and don't care about you, you look kind of weird. Why do you you keep helping other people when they wouldn't even, you can't even get anything back from them? Because that's what God's people do. You learn it in the scriptures. When you start to forgive people who've wronged you, you forgave her seriously? You did. Why? Because God forgave me and he calls me to. You look different. You shine the light in the darkness. But people start to wonder, what what is it with you Christians? There's there's a scene, and a a friend of mine actually produced this, one of the movies about this Richard Wormbrand who I was talking about earlier, and there's a scene where every day he would kneel in the middle of his cell and he would pray. And every time he prayed, they would beat him. But he wouldn't stop praying, so they wouldn't stop beating. 
And there's one scene where he's kneeling in the middle of the room and the guard comes in and the guard is like weary and he beats him again, but like the, the guard's getting sick of beating him. And he finally says to him, what are you, why do you keep praying? What are you praying for? And this pastor looks at him and he said, I'm praying for you. He said, I'm praying for you. And the guy just turns around and walks out of the cell. He doesn't know what to do with that. Now hopefully we won't have to live for Jesus at that level, but we can look different as we follow Jesus. When you have peace, when you have peace, this, our world is crazy. But when people look at you and they say, that even, I mean, and you know that the world's crazy and you, you deal with real challenges, but people look and go, at the end of the day, you're not freaking out. You walk in peace. People are going to go, why? Because you look different. The word of God leads us to this place of peace. When you have wisdom, and our, our world is, li- lives with such folly, and when you have wisdom, when people start coming to you asking for your insight because they realize you've got a perspective and an outlook that's healthy, and, and you, have a, you have a healthier marriage, or you're better with your kids, or you, you know how to you handle yourself different in business, because why? How do you? They start asking you for input or for advice. You don't just share it with them, but you let them know where that wisdom comes from. And we become a witness to the world as we grow in the scriptures. So one last question. What is my next step in Bible engagement? For you, what's, your, what's, what's next? I'll give you a couple words of encouragement. Number one, just every day, when your mind is fresh, when you're sharp, it could be over your lunch break, first thing in the morning, you might be sharp. Some of you people aren't sharp, you might be really sharp in the evening when things are quieting down, maybe they, the kids are down and settled. You know, some point in the day, or you can take a little, a little a piece of time and read or listen to the words of Scripture. Get it in your mind. Get it in your heart. Let it begin to shape how you live. That will be transformational. Again, we're in a time where the Bible is more accessible than ever and read and listened to less than ever, especially in the American culture. I challenge you every day. It, this, this alone will begin to change you. Change your listening patterns when you're driving or when you're, you know, and just and listen to scripture, listen to scripture. Let it fill your heart and your mind. I want to also challenge you to, to look at God's word in community. This fall, they'll be starting new small groups to think about some of the things you're looking at this summertime in greater depth. Jump into a small group. I don't know, it's not my thing. I don't like to get around other people and talk about stuff. I want to challenge you. There's something about, you know, you, you're all looking at the same passage in the Bible and you're talking and somebody else shares something and you're like, I never saw it that way. You're like, Bing, this, all of a sudden you get this new insight because somebody else shares their perspective. Then you share, and that person's like, man, that gives me fresh insight. There's something about being with God's people and listening to others and how the Holy Spirit has spoken to them that helps you grow and learn. Sherry and I talk about we learn the Bible all the time. I learn so many things just by hearing what God's teaching Sherry as she reads the Bible. And I hope the same is true going the other way, but we, we'll share those things and you gain insight in community. And then keep, keep being part of Peace Church whether you're online, whether you're on campus, and when you're, when you're in this time where you open the word together, open your heart, open your ears, because God wants to speak to you. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer, that we would become more like you. And Jesus, you loved the word. It was on your heart. It was on your lips. When you were on the cross bearing our sin, Jesus, it was scripture that poured out of your lips. You went to the Psalms because they were in your heart. May we be people who love your word and are growing in your word. I pray for each person today who's who's on campus, who's online, who's listening to these words, that you will inspire each person to go deeper into your word. Give us a greater love for the scriptures. Give us a commitment to learn something new every day out of the Bible. And oh Lord, our prayer is that we would live the truth of your word. It would shape our attitudes, our actions, our motives, all that we are. And Jesus, right now, as we respond, as we raise a hallelujah, as we declare that you, Lord, are Savior, Lord, save us, Lord, you are Savior, will you speak to our hearts about your word? As we sing this song, may we worship you, but by your spirit, would you speak to us and give us a next step we can take to go deeper into your word? 